Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. While, um, while people are still joining us here in the room, I know there's already many participants as well uh, joining us online, uh, including, including some of the speakers as well we have today. So I'm really excited uh, to be moderating today's session. Um, we are launching uh, the G7 Sustainable Supply Chain Initiative a report, a report that focuses on the private sector's contribution uh, to sustainable supply chains. And um, I, uh, it, it, it all started in 2021, uh, and the initiative was launched to convene 22 global food and agriculture companies that have pledged to improve on environmental, social, and nutritional impact of, the, of their own operations and their supply chains. Uh, what is very different in this pledge and this public-private uh, collaboration is that companies have pledged to improve as measured by the World Benchmarking Alliance's Food and Agriculture Benchmark. And I'm personally uh, your host and your moderator here today. Um, and I'm working for the World Benchmarking Alliance, leading the food and agriculture team. So I have overseen this, this research work. Um, and we have been brought in as an independent organization to monitor the progress of private sector's contribution. Um, this this work builds and uh, builds upon and looks at the implementation of several uh, global standards, global standards, existing frameworks, but also CFS products, including the CFS RI principles. So this G7 initiative is the first of its kind to embed monitoring from the start and by that create uh, an accountability mechanism for the private sector. So we are here today to inspire others and to learn from others uh, in this space to see how can we drive accountability and how can monitoring or also other examples that you maybe have here in the room or online help us uh, in that. So I'm, um, I'm really excited. We have a full agenda um, and hence, uh, hence starting uh, in person and just seeing whether um, also our first keynote speaker is, is online uh, already joining us. I think I will hand it over to, um, uh, to, to, to my colleague, Charlotte Reeves, because we're all here in the room to share with you the, um, the findings of this report. And I'm sure you're very keen to understand uh, <clears throat> what, uh, what has been found in the research. Um, and, um, and also noting one final thing you saw in the title of this session, that it is an open call as well, uh, an open call um, that will be elaborated on uh, in further detail also by, by other colleagues uh, from uh, and, and other organizations involved like the OECD, uh, but an open call for uh, in uh, ideas, um, sharing of learnings, but an open call to broaden it up beyond the G7 initiative, and that's why we are, we are here today. So I'd like to hand over the word to my colleague, Charlotte Reeves, who is the engagement manager of the World Benchmarking Alliance, and uh, will share with you the findings of uh, this private sector report on the G7 Sustainable Supply Chain Initiative. Charlotte, over to you. Thank you, Victoria, and welcome everyone. I'm glad to be here to present to you the findings of WBA's assessment of the companies signed up to the G7 Sustainable Supply Chain Initiative pledge. Are they making progress? Firstly, a brief summary of the G7 Sustainable Supply Chain Initiative, which was launched in 2021 by the UK government under the G7 presidency. The high level objective is to accelerate progress towards SDGs, specifically driving systemic change to enable sustainable agricultural supply chains. The UK mobilized a commitment from other G7 member states and food and agriculture companies headquartered in the G7 countries to work together on this. As such, the 22 companies pledged to keep improving the impact of their operations and supply chains as measured by the World Benchmarking Alliance. In 2022, the German government under the G7 presidency actively took on the initiative and appointed the OECD as the secretariat. To ensure the company pledge translates into action, the initiative centers around two main components, 
Firstly, assessing company progress, of which you'll see the results today. And second, the public and private collaboration, building on the insights of WBA's benchmark report to define blockages, inform policy interventions and support scale up. So parallel to the company assessment is an ongoing company and government dialogue to facilitate an exchange. Next slide, please. Firstly, a little bit about um, WBA's Food and Agriculture Benchmark. It was first launched in 2021 along the UN Food System Summit. It measures and compares 350 food and agriculture companies across the value chain on topics within four measurement areas of environment, nutrition, social inclusion, and governance and strategy. The assessment is based on publicly disclosed information and freely available on WBA's website. The next benchmark will be published in 2023 at the UN Food System Summit stock taking event. For companies part of the G7 Sustainable Supply Chain Initiative, WBA has done a 2022 assessment comparing their scores to the 2021 benchmark. The results that I will share in a minute focus on the collective group to examine firstly, are they progressing? then where are they improving and where are we still seeing gaps? These insights will help define the business and company actions needed to make progress on the, on the overall aim. So firstly, on the left, you will see a list of the companies signed up to the initiative. And to put in perspective their impact, these 22 companies earn approximately, approximately 500 billion US dollars dollars in annual global revenue, employ over 2 million people directly and millions more throughout the supply chains and are active in all segments of the value chain. And the results? WBA found that across each measurement area, the collective group has improved their scores since the 2021 benchmark. This supports that corporate accountability helps drive sustainable change. By increasing disclosure and transparency, companies are incentivized to make progress on key topics. Yes, there is still much to improve on, but these results are reason for optimism as progress has been made. If we look now at a company level, WBA found that since 2021, all companies had improved their disclosure by publishing new and relevant reports on their websites. 15 companies increased their performance on at least one of WBA's indicator. The environment measurement area saw the most progress with 13 companies approving on at least one indicator compared to last year. In contrast, only five improved on at least one indicator in the nutrition measurement area, which is the poorest scoring area in our benchmark. 11 companies improved in the social measurement area and nine across governance and strategy. Zooming now into the environmental topics. So you'll see a long list of the topics uh, of the indicators on the left, and then the number of companies scoring the highest score and the number of companies improved. Um, the most improvement was seen regarding reducing scope one and two emissions. While two companies improved disclosure on emissions, another four are notable for aligning their emission reduction targets with a 1.5 degree trajectory and reporting progress. In addition, in terms of reducing scope three emissions, we saw five companies improve their measuring and reporting. However, seven are yet to make any significant progress towards setting targets to reduce their scope three emissions. As suppliers and other value chain partners often represent the largest contribution to emissions, companies need to step up their efforts to work with their partners to reduce scope three emissions significantly in line with the Paris Agreement. I'd also like to highlight movement on topics related to regenerative agriculture, as several com companies have made new commitments in the last year. Of the companies assessed, Four showed improvements regarding reducing water use across their operations and supply chains. Three showed improvement on soil health and agrobiodiversity. And two companies strengthened their commitments towards optimizing fertilizer and pesticide use. One company, Danone, leads the way for its regenerative agriculture commitments and progress. Then when we're looking more at the gaps, um, compared to the 2021 benchmark, 
none of the companies improved on their commitments and progress towards achieving deforestation and conversion-free supply chains. Among the collective, only Unilever leads the way for its DCF target covering its high-risk commodities of cocoa, palm oil and soya supply chains. While other companies disclose some data, 13 are yet to provide DCF targets or report on the high-risk commodities, a further four are yet to close any type of commitment on this topic. We saw other gaps um, around protein diversification, antibiotic use and animal welfare. Now, if we go on to the nutritional measurement area, the area which saw the least progress, we saw three company improvements related to food safety. Sorry, if you could just change the slide, please. Thank you. Um, so three companies improvements related to food safety with one company, McCormick, disclosing most comprehensively on the implementation of food sa safety standards. Four companies already demonstrate best performance in increasing the availability of healthy foods, disclosing their reformulation strategies to reduce sugar, salt and fat, and setting time-bound targets to increase the share of products with an improved nutritional profile. However, only one company improved disclosure on this indicator, and over half of companies in the collective are yet to share any disclosure on how their business activities positively impact malnutrition. None of the companies made progress on ensuring their accessibility and affordability of healthy foods, which together with responsible marketing and workforce nutrition is among the nutrition topics with the poorest performance. For the social inclusion measurement area, Four of the companies assessed have updated their policy requirements to prevent and eliminate child labour in their own operations and supply chains. Two of these four companies also improved on forced labour. However, gaps remain when it comes to introduce, introducing policy requirements for companies' supply chain partners. In particular, the requirements not to interfere with the right of workers to form and join trade unions and to establish a monitoring and verification process to identify and assess human rights issues are weak or missing from a lot of the company policies. Four of the 20 companies assessed demonstrated an improvement on the land rights indicator, of which three of these companies significantly improved disclosure regarding their commitment to recognise and respect land tenure rights in their supply chains. Nonetheless, 13 companies are yet to formulate robust, robust policy commitments to respect the rights of legitimate tenure holders when acquiring, leasing or using land. None of the 20 companies demonstrated progress in ensuring a living wage and protecting the health and safety of vulnerable groups, that is women and migrant workers. 20 companies do not disclose a commitment to pay workers a living wage and 17 do not identify the health and safety risk of vulnerable workers in the operations and supply chains. Only Unilever demonstrates leading practices on both these topics, um, which are one of the worst performing of all the indicators in the benchmark. And last but not least, we have the governance and strategy measurement area. Eight companies have fully integrated a sustainable development strategy with objectives into their business model. And we saw three companies improve and strengthen their sustainability strategy since last year. Moreover, all companies provide disclosure in this area. We saw some big improvements from seven companies increasing their disclosure regarding their governance and accountability system for sustainable development. And four companies elaborated on their stakeholder engagement approach. However, we still see that eight companies are yet to disclose information about the process they use to identify stakeholders and incorporate the outcomes of stakeholder engagement activities into their sustainability strategy. Two companies, Unilever and Diageo, lead the way by achieving the highest scores on all three of these indicators. So in conclusion, we believe that corporate accountability helps drive progress because it through the increase of disclosure and transparency companies are incentivized to take action 
Not enough, but it's a start. And it doesn't stop there, as we will assess this, the progress of these companies and the broader 350 in the Food and Agriculture Benchmark in 2023 at the UN Food System Stocktaking event next year. It's also key to remember that monitoring alone is only part of a process of holding co corporates to account and that ongoing collaboration with G7 co governments and companies is key to accelerate progress in this initiative. So I want to thank you all for listening. The report is online and I believe has been shared in the chat function. So we're happy to any answer any questions during the Q&A and after the event. Back to you, Victoria. Thank you very much, Charlotte. And I can imagine for people in the audience, but also people online, that it, it might be very technical and that you might have a lot of questions. Be reassured, uh, we've got a team online uh, available from our research team to answer any, any questions. And we will also have uh, an elaborate Q&A uh, a bit later on after we've heard some, some other first reflections uh, about this report, but also in general about the initiative. As I said, this is an initiative between governments and the private sector and where monitoring is helping to, as, to independently assess where progress is being made so not just to stop at at a pledge and a commitment but really digging into the figures uh, and uh, and assessing whether whether progress is being made and uh, I'm joined by one of the companies here on stage uh, Mr. Paul from BSF but also another and many more companies online but we've pulled out uh, just two companies to give in and it gives a first reflection and uh, and more if, if if they will be interested but I'd actually first want to call on um, on a company from Japan, Meiji. Mr. Yasuo Tekuochi uh, is joining us uh, and he uh, his company is part of this initiative that was uh, launched last year. Um, and I'm very curious, yeah, very, very interested to hear from uh, Mr. Takuchi um, that given the results and given the, co the overall conclusion that really already in one year, in 12 months, account this monitoring, this accountability has created progress, but how is the experience from a company's perspective? Why has, uh, has the company, um, uh, what was the motivation for the company to join the initiative, but also uh, any learnings uh, they would might, might want to share? So, uh, Mr. Takochi, I'd like to kindly give you the floor uh, to join us from Japan. Thank you so much uh, for being with us and over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, for good opportunity at this meeting. Uh, I appreciate the Japanese government, OECD, and WBA. Uh, I'm Yasuo Takeuchi at Major Holdings in Japan. Uh, at first, I would like to introduce uh, Major Holdings. Uh, Major Holdings is a conglomerate of enterprises engaged in the processing of foods such as uh, dairy products and chocolates, as well as the pharmaceutical business, including the development of vaccine and uh, antibacterial agents. Uh, so the main commodity are dairy, cocoa, and palm oil in food business. In the uh, procurement of cocoa for chocolate production, we work to conserve forest through the COCO uh, Forest Initiative uh, operated by the World COCO Foundation, of which we are a member. We also join the International COCO Initiative to help eliminate child labor and forced labor in COCO production. We will begin to encourage the purchasing of COCO affiliate affiliated with uh, preventing and addressing child labor and forced labor programs. We support cocoa farmers through a major cocoa support program, which is expanded to a total of nine countries, Ghana, Peru, Ecuador, Venezuela, Mexico, and the Dominican Republic, Brazil, Vietnam, and Madagascar. And also in the example of nutrition at Vietnam in Asia, we help alleviate the social issue of 
nutrition amongst pregnant women, nursing mothers, and young women through actions to improve dietary conditions, such as teaching female factory workers about nutrition and delivering nutritional fortified milk. So uh, Charlotte and Victoria asked me the question, some question. Uh, my answer is uh, we joined uh, CEO consultation of UN Food System Summit in last year. After UN Food System Summit, uh, WBA and also Japanese government, Ministry of Agriculture, Forest, Forestry and uh, Fishers asked us to join the G7 SSCI. So we joined the G7 SSCI. I think that WBA food agriculture benchmark and G7 SSCI assessment are very useful for us. We can recognize our, our weak indicators, which we will improve by WBA benchmark and the G7 SSCI assessment. The indicator of WBA benchmark are focused on food and agriculture, and also different, a little different from the questionnaire of general ESG agency. For example, MSCI, FTSE, and DGSI Sustainalytics. So we can learn how European company, for example, uh, Danone company have progressed on the regenerative agriculture through the G7 SSCI. So we can add the knowledge to our ESG strategy and uh, prioritize priorities the actions. In closing, we will collaborate with the G7 government and initiative member as we continue to strive towards the realization of sustainable food system. I'm looking forward to meeting you again at the WBA Benchmark 2023. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Takochi. And it's interesting to hear your 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 journey. Uh, that the, with the the collaborations and the conversations following the UN Food Systems Summit have uh, have also brought this initiative uh, together. As I said, we have a, a company here in the room today, uh, BASF, and uh, Mr. Paul. I'd like to ask you the the, the same questions. Really, your general motivation uh, for a company like yours uh, to be part of this initiative. As as you see, there's uh, just for the audience here, really the companies that joined up are from across the value chain. So you've heard Mr. Takochi mention uh, Meiji's focus and uh, BASF, of course, being a, a major agricultural uh, company. We've also got food companies in their processors. It's a really interesting mix and uh, I'd like to hand it over to you to uh, give some first reflections. Yeah, thank you very much. And uh, it's, it's a pleasure to give a kind of insight in how BASF is looking at this whole initiative and demonstrate a little bit why this is so important for us. So um, <clears throat> why, why did we join that initiative? So the G7 SSCI is an initiative that is targeting things that we have in our company commitments anyhow. Right? So we have our sustainability targets defined. These are oriented against those global drivers that determine where we are in regard to societal expectations it is climate change, it is biodiversity, food security, what is a very important part here. And what we see here in such kind of initiative is a, is a tool to make this kind of progress that we have committed to make it visible to others in the stakeholder community. So from that point of view, we find it very important to be part of, uh, of such uh, initiative. And we also appreciate that, that WBA is um, the assessor, the, 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 the organization that provides a tool to make this whole progress measurable. And on the other side, the big political support through the G7 initiative. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Paul, for that. Uh, those 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 reflections and and your motivation. And I was um, <clears throat> really uh, yeah positively encouraged to hear you also mention food security. And of course, we are at the CFS here today, and just want. Um, uh, and that's a good bridge to our next speaker as well, because um, Victoria, sorry, um, no. I, I just just want to chime in here. It was not meant that this is so short. So we have three questions here on our on our speaking notes, and uh, you raised the first one. The second one is even more important. The third one will come after. So I was not sure if you would raise the question again. So and the second question is. Um, why did you feel as a company that reporting is, is helpful or which role does it play? And here I must say that transparency is key. Yeah? So as I said, we want to make it visible, um, but transparency has two sides. Uh, transparency is on the one hand side that the society can see what we do. On the other side, we need transparency about the indicators. So measuring something is, uh, is a kind of thing that can be very biased huh? and indicator transparency in a process is key so um, going back to the, the question what role does reporting play i must say it is a very important um, point to say visibility transparency and that might also go into the direction where bsf is providing um, examples. Uh, so reporting means also look into your own business, look what you do and what you can provide and prove. Um, and this is what, what measuring does. It's not simply saying, it's only, it's also walk the talk. Yeah. So providing proof of what we do. And you're welcome to check the, the BSF sites on um, agricultural development projects like uh, starting ventures or um, BSF farming stories, then you can see the evidence and reporting uh, plays a very big role here to provide this kind of evidence. And the third question to close that uh, was about lessons learned. Lessons learned and um, such kind of ESG and CSR reporting, that is not new for us as a company. So we are a big um, multinational and you can imagine that there's a lot of uh, I would say scrutiny about our business, and that's good. And this scrutiny is is also then uh, creating a lot of uh, different, or has generated a lot of organizations that evaluate us. So for us, um, it is clear that this whole ESG reporting is uh, something where we internally can can help to better document what we do to make it visible, but also we get the pressure to a better problem formulation. So whatever we do should start with a clear problem formulation. What are the targets? What is our sustainability commitment moving forward? And whatever provide deliverables, evidence. This is important to us. And this is a lesson learned that uh, we could do better here internally sometimes. And so it, it helps us also. Um, I, I would like to close here what I want to say about um, the whole exercise. And in, in the end, it's all about the question, what is driving societal acceptance? And I feel that this kind of visibility, transparency, measuring and reporting is a, is a cornerstone, a cornerstone for engaging civil society stakeholders from, from all areas to get to that common goal, to get a kind of societal acceptance, a societal license, and a reflection about the value that business is bringing to the society. Thanks. Thank you very much. And apologies for the, <laughs> for the confusion earlier. Uh, especially really good to, to hear, hear your learnings and, uh, and also the role about reporting. Um, I know there have been sessions uh, this week about data collection and that this is on a broader front, uh, something on the top of our minds um, as well. 
Uh, so, <clears throat> and and with with what you mentioned earlier about food security, um, I see a colleague from the UK here in the room. This initiative has been uh, initiated by the UK presidency last year, uh, the UK's presidency of the G7, uh, and this year has been taken on by the German uh, presidency. And uh, just to give a bit more um, uh, input from from the political side and 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 from the governmental perspective, this initiative has been housed at the G7 at the Food Security Working Group. It's coming coming from that, uh, that sphere. And so I'd like to um, hand it over to um, one of the German representatives with us online here today from uh, GIZ, Charlotte von Essen from the Agricultural Department, uh, to share some of the reflections and some of the uh, more governmental perspectives around this initiative. So Ms. Von Essen, can I uh, please give the floor to you? Um, yes, thank you. Thanks, Victoria. Just needed to unmute myself. Um, thank you all uh, for being here today. And I'm delighted to represent the German government um, and as G7 chair today. At the BMZ, um, we are working towards the socio-ecological transformation of our economic food system. And to achieve this, we need to put food security, fair trading practices and climate action at the core of all our endeavors. Sustainability at every level in the supply chain and in all dimensions, ecological, social and economic. Our global agri-food system and the respective supply chains are one central component of this transformation. We are all key stakeholders in this global agriculture and food sector. That is why it is of utmost importance that we enhance compliance with international standards relating to human rights, environment and labor across global supply chains. As governments, we need to support uh, or we need to support uh, we need the support of the private sector, sorry, to make this a reality. And the actions taken by businesses along our global agricultural supply chains can make a significant contribution. Our shared goal must be to achieve sustainable and resilient agri-food systems that ensure food security worldwide, promote decent work, and reduce poverty while protecting the environment. And we know this is quite ambitious. And the obstacles that stand in the way of this goal must be met with a joint effort of the private and the public sector. Only together, we can work towards the necessary transformation of our global food systems. The G7 Sustainable Supply Chain Initiative, G7 SSCI in short, facilitates this cooperation. The initiative brings together 22 of the world's largest players in the agri-food sector to discuss challenges and scale up change-driven projects to make a systemic change. The initiative was established under the British G7 presidency last year, as Victoria already said, and due to its relevance and urgency with which action must be taken, the initiative has received our strong support during the German G7 presidency as well. With the OECD Center for Responsible Business Conduct leading the coordination of the Sustainable Supply Chain Initiative, we are grateful to have a strong and reliable partner by our side to establish the initiative as a credible and impactful platform for dialogue and action. We are also delighted that the 22 companies have committed to improving the sustainability along their supply chains and business operations on the basis of the 45 indicators set out in the Food and Agriculture Benchmark provided by the World Benchmarking Alliance. To us, the Food and Agriculture Benchmark constitutes an important independent monitoring system that holds companies accountable for their contributions to the Sustainable Development Goals. For example, some indicators are directly linked to the food security and nutrition as they measure issues such as food loss and waste or the availability and accessibility of healthy foods as we've already seen today. So we were very excited to learn about the results of this year's benchmark for the companies of the G7 SSCI. And we highly appreciate that these companies have engaged with the food and agriculture benchmark to publicly demonstrate progress in their sustainability activities. The partnership of the G7 initiative with the WBA 
allows for increased transparency regarding what companies are already doing and where further efforts may be needed. It also creates a level playing field where companies are able to compare their endeavors. Such an independent accountability mechanism is invaluable. At this point, we would like to express our utmost appreciation to the World Benchmarking Alliance for their excellent work in assessing and evaluating the private sector action. The Food and Agriculture Benchmark is instrumental to measure progress on our way to the food system transformation. In addition, we see the OECD FAO guidance on responsible agriculture supply chains as a complementary and helpful tool to guide companies in their due diligence processes and to provide suggestions to improve their sustainability actions. The combined use of the OECD FAO guidance and the Food and Agriculture Benchmark will help drive significant progress in the sector. It is our great pleasure today to invite more global food and agriculture companies present here today to join our initiative, also beyond G7 countries. You have a key role to play to transform our food systems and fight hunger and malnutrition. Working collaboratively, sharing best practices and fostering dialogue with all relevant stakeholders is key to reaching joint solutions. With more businesses from more countries taking part in this initiative, we can expand the impact of our actions along global agricultural supply chains. I would especially like to thank the participating companies from the agriculture and food sector for their commitment. Thank you for joining the initiative and being open for this unique opportunity of public and private dialogue. Last but not least, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the World Benchmarking Alliance and the Center for Responsible Business Conduct of the OECD for the immense of efforts and support in this initiative during the German G7 presidency. Thank you very much and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Von Essen. And I think especially for the audience here today, that was <clears throat> that perspective from a government perspective was really useful. Also about the initiation of this project and, and, and why it has been continued under the, the German presidency and, uh, and is, uh, is being followed up uh, as we go along. We have um, a panelist for you of really interesting multi-stakeholder uh, speakers. One of them is with me on stage here today, Mr. Michael Keller representing uh, is chair of the International Agri-Food Network. Uh, we also have an investor, we have civil society, uh, and we have a representative from the FAO. Um, firstly, I'd, I'd like to uh, introduce you to uh, Lotte Beck, who is the senior ESG manager of Global Equity Investments Team at Macquarie. And Macquarie has been supporting this initiative from the very start uh, and has been encouraging companies to sign up. They have been very very actively engaged in this initiative last year at the at the at the launch and i would like to give the floor uh, to ms beck to to speak to uh, to us from the investor perspective and how investors are supporting this but also including data points like uh, like this report has gathered uh, in their analysis and in their work to also to drive companies uh, performance ms beck over to you thank you Victoria, I hope you can all hear me. I'm sitting here with my fingers crossed because I already lost uh, the connection to, to Zoom three times. So I hope that I will remain with you throughout the panel session. It's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so uh, yes, as you mentioned, we were involved already at the launch and uh, encouraged our portfolio companies from this industry to join. So I'm happy to see six portfolio companies have pledged and joined the initiatives and are highlighted in the progress report presented today. I think that uh, voluntary initiatives where actors pledge to support or improve uh, different areas have proven more effective or at least more uh, successful than regulation oftentimes. Uh, so, for example, initiatives like the UN Global Compact are valuable because the companies align with the values and see the benefit that uh, such initiatives and forums can provide. So, for example, at the COP26, we also saw a lot of companies pledging net zero goals that were way ahead or much more ambitious than the public actors. So this uh, collaboration is, is very much important and also why initiatives like this uh, has such high value. The, the private sector as such, such has an uh, opportunity uh, and also the influence to really change the status quo. 
this is of course necessary <coughs> as the private sector also plays a major role when it comes to the less positive aspects. So the global challenges that we all face, as is also mentioned in the progress report. So the ag agricultural system um, accounts for 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So it's fine to have the intention to lower one's emission, but we also need uh, that accountability. And here initiatives like the G7 SSCI and also corporate reporting uh, plays an essential role to us as investors. So the investors need to follow company progress and we need assurance that the companies not only pledge ambitious goals, which is fine, but also work to achieve them. And progress reports like this one published today are essential, at least to active investors like us. So you ask also what our role is here. And in my team, we see ourselves as business owners, which means that we also need to be comfortable with what goes on at company level. We need to hold the companies accountable. And that also means uh, in my team that we don't rely on third party ratings. We do our own research and use company disclosure and reporting as a starting point for engagement dialogue, which is an essential tool uh, to us. Uh, so reporting can help us identify the risks and the opportunities and areas for us to focus on. So uh, progress reporting and benchmark reports also published by the WBA underline the importance of reporting, I think. So if you don't report on progress, you don't improve. That's kind of the uh, the image you get. So like on social media, if I didn't document my run this morning, did I really do it? So the assumption is if you don't report on it, it's because you're not doing anything. So for us, company reporting is an essential part of, of our investment decision making. So for example, across Macquarie Asset Management, we have the intention to manage all portfolios towards net zero by 2040. And for this to happen, the food and agriculture companies play a major role. What I appreciate about the SSCI and the WBA benchmark is that it covers all the topics relevant to get there. So not only greenhouse gas emission, but ecosystems and soil health, pesticides, plastics, uh, it's all connected and equally important to reaching our global goals and the SDGs and net zero. So ambitions are good. Reporting and accountability is better. We also say if you measure it, you manage it. So uh, just to highlight what was also said in the beginning, monitoring is, is one aspect to accountability. What uh, is really the key here is the collaboration between the different actors. Thank you very much, Ms. Beck. It's good to you. And we, we always say we, when measure, what gets measured gets done, indeed. Yeah. So indeed, to get, to, <laughs> to get, get monitored and uh, assessed. And your, your intervention is very um, timely as well for us here today at the CFS as uh, following the side event, we will move on to the plenary where we will be focusing on investing in food systems. So the role of investors uh, is really key. And I feel that we have um, often not enough investors as well in the room. Um, but who we, who we have in the room and is with me up here today is Mr. Michael Keller. Um, and in his capacity, of course, representing here the private sector mechanism. Um, and this initiative, uh, this G7 Sustainable Supply Chain Initiative is a private and public collaboration. Uh, and I'm, I'm wondering um, what, what reflections Mr. Keller has also from this broader private sector uh, background and also whether, whether there's any, in, any learnings from other initiatives that we can, uh, we can take on. So the, the floor is yours. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Victoria. There's no other question coming. That's the one. <laughs> now, first of all, um, I would like to thank the UK and, and also Germany and J7 to have taken this initiative. And I would like to reposition. What is the question? It's moving the needle to transform agricultural transformation. That's what we are looking for. That means what we are looking for is also to progress towards SDGs. That's what we're looking for. That's what we're looking for is also to increase our capacity to decrease the issue on food security. And I think that's an important one. And therefore I would like to say a couple of things. First, I think during the recent years, it's acceptable, it's tremendous. The recognition the private sector is playing, has to play and will play when we have to address transforming 
ARC systems and to fight against food insecurity. Uh, insecurity. At the same time, we also see now um, an impressive multiplication of dashboards, GAFS by the German government, or we see uh, Lawrence Haddad and others on nutrition security, or we see Sophie report by Maximo Terrero um, on the issues we are facing today, but also on a more constant periodic basis to ensure um, security security, food security. And I think this is one part. And then that's the overall assessment. There is something to do. And now the private sector has to do, and we all agree. And I think the idea to start to build um, also um, somehow an index or an assessment, what the private sector has to do is extremely important. And we really appreciate what World Benchmark, uh, Benchmark um, Allens is doing because we have also some experience um, with you. Perhaps we could say today, oh, that's not a lot of companies. Yes, it's not a lot of companies. And when I'm thinking on the whole agri-food chain, that's 10,000s of companies. Where are they here? And to fix it, in any case, we need to think how we can also bring these um, companies in. The important one um, is also, um, we need to think that there's yet a lot of reporting yet happening. ESG, we heard about human rights, global impact. But what is more important, and I think that's the point I would like to make today, it's important. But what is also important is to recognize the complexity where we also as private sectors are acting. The complexity in terms of can be the natural complexity of an ecosystem. That means can be the question where are we are acting, where's the value chain starting? Smallholders, do they have access on seed? Which kind of seed? That means this is for us when we speak about transforming agriculture, we need also to think it's starting somewhere. It's somewhere very concrete. And this one, we need to fix it. We need to fix on the ground. We need to fix it there to build the value chain. I think this complexity, we need to, to, to assess it. And I think this is something we, we need also to integrate when we go further. It is clear the whole complexity of the agri-food chain. It is not just, hey, we do it, we go. No, there's a complexity also of actors. And I think if we want, I'm coming back, moving the needle to progress it is also for us companies, the enabling business environment. That means where we are acting as a company also in countries. And we know we have issues on food security in Africa. We have issues of food security in Asia. That means, can we do more in the countries concretely? Why we are not doing more in these countries concretely? And there is then for me, where I'm going back, we have dashboards, important dashboards, recognizing the issues on security, food security. And we have dashboards assessing companies. How we can bring the bits together really to move the needle is also to think concretely, we need the right business environment also on the ground that the companies can support, contribute, and even go further in achieving the SDG. Thank you very much, Mr. Keller, for your impassionate uh, and clear, clear calls to action and and learnings and shared learnings. Really, uh, <clears throat> really taking them uh, on board and very useful for us uh, moving forward. Um, I would like to give the floor to um, Jean Francois from uh, the WWF, who is uh, joining us from Brazil. So uh, thank you so much for being with us during this time. Uh, Jean-Francois Timmers is the Policy and Advocacy Manager for Deforestation and Conversion-Free Supply Chains at WWF. And um, in this, while well, this initiative has been very broad, it's really, as, as Michael reflected, it's about SDGs, it's about food systems. Um, you see that the, the biggest improvements are in the environmental uh, area and uh, around agricultural uh, transformation. 
I'm really interested to hear uh, Jean Francois's uh, his reflections on that, and uh, and also to define uh, from from the civil society's perspective uh, what really is important to take on in this public-private uh, initiative that we have here at hand. So. Um, Mr. Timmers, I'd like to give the floor to you. Thank you again for joining us from Brazil. Over to you. Thank you very much. Yes, this is a, a great question. Actually, we see uh, this effort as a fantastic effort for uh, establishing a holistic uh, food system transformation. But there are uh, levels of urgency. And uh, we were uh, concerned to see that although there is progress on reducing emissions, uh, there is a lack of progress, certainly on on deforestation and conversion, on the on the on stopping or eliminating the destruction of ecosystems. The problem is uh, uh, deforestation and conversion is increasing in places where there is still a lot of forest. So the intensity of destruction is still increasing, and that has very severe environmental and social impacts. Also uh, harming the possibility of our, our global systems to sustain itself in uh, the mid and long term. So we need to work uh, in different timescales together. So while making a, a steady systemic transformation of all our systems and our economies to sustainability, we need also urgent measure to stop expanding on the very remaining natural ecosystems. If we want to have a, a future, a chance of a future and of a steady economy uh, in the mid long term. Uh, so critical ecosystems uh, uh, services are depleted and uh, there is a, an urgency to that. The good news is there are tools available that allow full transparency, full traceability to the farm level at very large scale, as it was demonstrated in the, in the Amazon for soy, in the soil moratorium, but there are many other examples. The other good news is there is a lot of degraded areas already available that can uh, be restored, uh, rehabilitated through sustainable food production and allow to expand and, and meet the growing demand for food while not needing to cut uh, these remaining ecosystems and eventually restore their ecosystem services. Uh, so yes, we have this challenge of working in the short term while working also in the long term. Full traceability and transparency also, a last, a last thought is, there is no clear separation between environmental issues and social issues in some aspects. And we've seen uh, in the places uh, that we've been working, a very severe social impact of the expansion of commodities. And uh, we see transparency and full traceability to the origin as a critical instrument for reducing these impacts as well. Uh, so yes, uh, there is a, a promising uh, discussion happening in Europe, in the EU, on uh, uh, deforestation conversion law. And uh, we are strongly supporting that, uh, that legislation uh, discussion, uh, as it may allow to establish a benchmark for full traceability and uh, including, that is uh, our hope, uh, all natural ecosystems and not just forests. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Timmers. That really, especially coming from the ground from, from uh, Brazil and, and speaking to us uh, on the criticality of ecosystems, just in a conversation earlier with, with, with one of the people in the room, we were speaking about ecosystems. And, uh, and so all your, your uh, comments were really well, well received here. I, I want to go over to a representative from the FAO who's joining us online. <laughs> we are here <laughs> uh, welcomed by, by, by the FAO for this CFS uh, event. But we're, <clears throat> the next panel speaker is uh, Tomislav Ivanic, Ivancic, sorry, Global Advisor on the Responsible Business Conduct and Agricultural Supply Chains. And, I'm, and we've asked uh, Mr. Ivancic to uh, be with us here today because um, uh, he was also closely involved with working with the OECD, who, as you've heard from the German government, is, 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 is really convening this initiative uh, this year and, and, and hosting it as a secretariat. And he, we will hear from the OECD later on as well. Uh, 
So um, would really like to hand it over to him to share with us also some learnings about how can this initiative, and this was brought up earlier, also be impactful and meaningful in middle and low income countries. Of course, it doesn't mean that uh, because it's housed and it started within the G7 that it's only affecting G7 countries. Please note that this is um, the companies involved are, are headquartered in a G7 country, but of course their supply chains run globally. Um, but really uh, interested to hear from Mr. Ivancic how we can ensure more inclusivity and how uh, we can take this initiative uh, meaningfully forward. So uh, over to you, uh, Mr. Ivancic, thank you. Thank you so much and colleagues, good afternoon. And, and you know, a very big thank you for, for inviting us to join this, this panel and congratulations on the excellent report. There is a lot of really great findings um, that really helped drive better responsibility and, 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 and corporate knowledge, really. And even, you know, uh, there's something for everything here from civil society organizations, governments, et cetera, to be able to really pick out what, what, what's working and what's not working when we look at agricultural supply chains and um, development risks, really. Um, but, I, you know, I'd like to start my kind of intervention here by taking a step back and kind of understanding first what's really needed for companies to better report on social and environmental impacts in their supply chains, right? And how could they improve um, their scoring and, and, and their position in such excellent reports as we just seen from the WBA. Um, you know, and, and that there's no perfect answer to this, but um, I can certainly say from our cooperation with the OECD um, and our co-lead on the OECD file guidance for responsible agricultural supply chains that, you know, one of the most practical ways um, for companies to, around the world really, to, to en enhance their understanding of uh, impacts um, in agricultural supply chains is really to introduce effective due diligence measures, right? We know that traditionally many companies have outsourced, um, you know, their development problems or their social environmental risks to auditors, to certification bodies, et cetera. And, and you know, that always, it, it hasn't always done them many favors, right? And, and, and we know that now there is an increasing push, as we've heard from legislation and our dear speaker from Brazil here, um, to, to move towards greater company ownership of their risks in their supply chains, right? And um, the five-step framework for risk-based due diligence that um, is really the core of the OECD FAO guidance helps companies understand practically what they can do to better identify, mitigate, and respond to development risks in their supply chains, right? We know that companies can irritate development and, and contribute, to, of course, and support development positively um, in many different ways, right? We, uh, we know what the positives are in terms of job creation and economic growth and all of the important things that, that really drive the world and that drive uh, sustainability in, in many ways. But we know that those adverse effects can um, oftentimes cancel out some of those um, of those positive developments um, in that uh, sense, right? And that includes deforestation, child labor, occupational safety, health, uh, occupational safety, uh, health and safety, um, and other many salient impacts in agricultural supply chains. But you know, really, once when companies do have due diligence set in place, you know, it doesn't automatically mean that they're set up for a better position or a better ranking, I guess we can say in this context, right? Um, we also need to consider where that company trades and where that company does business, right? Um, you know, when you sit at a headquarters level in Paris, in Zagreb, in, in New York, or wherever you are, um, that's very different than when you're based um, in a low and middle income country, right? And your respective development challenges there are, 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 are very different. They're, um, you're faced at the front lines of development risks in many instances, which um, place you in a different operational reality, right? And we've heard that there's a lack of information, right, um, as well. And some companies may not report on some things in their supply chains. And oftentimes that's because there's a lack of formalized data. Right, um, you know, deforestation in, in 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 one instance is many times companies do not report on on issues such as deforestation or even child labor. Is you know that's exactly admitting um, that maybe they're going against national laws in 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 some instances, and likewise. Um, in some middle, low and middle income countries, there isn't a corporate culture of responsible business conduct or sustainability, 
right? But rather a corporate culture of working alongside development, right? Where basic development survival and development risks are often integrated parts of the everyday life of doing business, right? Just last week or the week before I was in Portugal and I moderated a panel session with the trade union in Pakistan uh, where we were discussing some of the sector sustainability challenges in the cotton sector. And, you know, we really turned to, to our speaker, frankly, and we said, look, how do you think or how do you hear about all of these or consider these sustainability initiatives and legislations that are taking place around the world? And he, you know, frankly turned to us and said, look, we struggle with workers uh, who, who live below the poverty line, right? And we have basic sanitation facilities. We struggle with access to electricity or drinking water. So for us, you know, um, these sustainability initiatives are great, what you're doing in, in many other country contexts, but, you know, we need to take things back to a level and address our development impacts um, so that, you know, you can address your sustainability initiatives downstream, right? So I do think that it's important that we can really do understand that there is a big difference often when we talk about downstream supply chains and upstream supply chains where risk often is most salient. Now I'll speak to two items here and I promise I'll pass the floor back to our, our, our dear moderator is really pointing out some of the reports, um, the WBA reports um, um, relevance for a low and middle income context. So companies that trade and that operate in uh, upstream levels, right? And that re one response to environmental measurement, which we know that um, you know, in the WA report, um, most progress was actually covered and captured in environmental measurement, which is great, right? Um, but, in, you know, when we look at low and middle income countries, that often takes different forms, right? Uh, again, deforestation often goes undisclosed when we talk about environmental issues, but also greenhouse gas emissions, right? We know that GHG, as we've heard, is the largest, one of the largest emitters um, in the world, in the agricultural sector. Um, but, you know, companies in, in low and middle income contexts really struggle to, to even identify scopes one and two emissions, right? The, what, what we see in, in, in high income countries that, that companies often really have um, organized, um, you know, in, in, in developing countries, uh, these companies often, often struggle with uh, a lack of data, outdated equipment, lack of formal business relationships, which, which makes it difficult for them to even collect data or understand where to begin uh, within these contexts. And lastly is social inclusion. Right, we saw that in the uh, WA report, there is greater um, 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 involvement of companies to understand different ways that they can be impacting on on different groups in society. When we look at upstream um, agricultural supply chains, there is a very very urgent need to onboard groups, onboard groups groups such as youth. Um, ethnic or religious minorities, women or other marginalized groups, right? Um, and this is a considerable challenges owing, a challenge owing to the variety of social, cultural, or even economic challenges um, in many developing countries, such as structural unemployment and lack of jobs, basically. So, uh, Victoria, with that, I'll end here and I'll pass the floor back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tomislav, really <clears throat> uh, for sharing your, your your thoughts, but also for making it really practical and for bringing it down to the the essence of what needs to happen, what needs to happen on the field, uh, and how that impacts uh, the different different parties involved, from 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 companies to governments to civil society. Each of the stakeholders have a role to play, and. Um, and we here together in this room have a role to play. And I'd, I'd like to hand open the floor to uh, the participants here for any any reflections, questions, but also uh, most of all your 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 learnings and your your suggestions you have on initiatives like this, or if you want to share examples, please. Gordon Bacon, I'm with the Global Pulse Confederation. I'm also 50 years a farmer, both as a farmer's son, family farm laborer, but the farm owner and operator as well. So I'd like to offer my comments on um, the, first of all, congratulations. I really like to see these aggregate measures of performance, but they are limited in their value as it would apply to a farm level. Even at our farm level, we would not simply look at one aggregate measurement for the farm related to environmental impact or productivity because the variability of the ecosystem as was mentioned is key. So I think aggregate measures, especially at G7 level, are interesting, but the variability around the mean is incredibly important. And policies 
must be ecosystem specific because at a national level, there is too much variability to suggest that one approach will be appropriate for each ecosystem within that country. I'll just illustrate my point by saying uh, data from one field will show that uh, the return on investment as measured by yield uh, varies within the field because there are certain areas where it makes more sense to more intensively apply fertilizer and in the same field to not apply the same amount of fertilizer or even zero because the return is there. And I'm so I think we need elements of productivity included in our sustainability measurements, but critical to that is productivity relative to the ecosystem's ability to handle utilization without causing ecosystem harm. I think it applies to forests. I think it applies to aquatic environments as well, where what we do is limited by ecosystem boundaries. And so we need to move beyond looking at broad uh, measurements, aggregated measurements at a policy level for certain, we must ensure that we are encouraging ecosystem appropriate actions. Thank you. That's a really valuable comment, Mr. Beacon. And thank you so much for, for, for sharing that and also for, for, for sharing your personal notes and your experience. Um, and uh, co coming from a farm around, farm around table I've hosted two weeks ago, <laughs> indeed there was a plot of land as big as this room and the yields were different uh, on each, in each side. So indeed there is a need to, to bridge that gap of the global discussions we are having at this level, but also the impact that is being realized on the ground and also for companies as such, uh, of course, making that bridge across the value chain, but uh, really looking into what the most vulnerable populations, uh, how they are being impacted and hopefully they are being helped in progressing in these important areas. Thank you. Um, please, and uh, are there any other uh, comments or reflections, um, ideas or suggestions uh, that you'd like, like to share with us here today? Um, there, there's the chat function open online as well, and uh, you've, 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 you've seen all of our uh, different companies, so you, you are able to reach out to us as well after, after this session, uh, if you want, please, the lady on the... Hi, thank you, Janice Giddens with U.S. Dairy Export Council. I'd also like to congratulate you on the publication of this and, and say that as a registered dietitian, I was thrilled to see that nutrition was included. So often nutrition is, is left out of ESG rankings. And I think that it's critically important, not only for the ranking, but also the weight that it was given in the methodology. You know, it was given equal weight with environment and social inclusion. So I do have a little bit more of a technical question, but I know you said that there's some technical folks on the line. So um, if needed, maybe they can help out. U.S. Dairy Export Council has a few companies that were ranked in the 2021 benchmark and cooperatives that we've reached out to about the survey and trying to help them prep for the 2023. And I noticed in the methodology that in the past, it was a survey that was sent for companies, but now it will be a draft assessment sent to companies to react to. So I was just curious if you could give us a little perspective on the change. Thank you. No, absolutely. Thank you so much. And uh, and and indeed, nutrition is, is 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 of essence, but still for us also a difficult one to crack from a research perspective. So always keen to to hear how how that also can be improved. Very practically, for indeed the the 2023 assessment. Um, so this initiative is is uh, about 22 companies, but next year we will have our second evaluation of 350 companies across the value chain, major, big global multinational companies. Um, and we've made that change from a survey to uh, sharing a draft assessment next year, uh, because the feedback from companies was that a survey was, it was unclear how, pe how companies were, um, were being uh, ranked already and where they could contribute and where additional information would be useful or where not. So by uh, we want to limit the reporting burden. Um, and so next year, when we share uh, the draft assessment, uh, it will indeed not be a, a survey, uh, but it will be an assessment so that for each 
topic, it can be seen whether a company has met certain elements of that assessment, or we haven't found data in the public domain on that. So hopefully that will help companies uh, to quickly track on, on where there are potential gaps uh, and where they could provide additional information uh, or to make a, a quicker analysis of, of whether the information that we've, uh, <clears throat> we've, we've brought together, whether that is complete. Well, we can take it up in more detail separately, but that hope, hopefully that gives gives you already a, a bit of a background. Any final other questions or thoughts? If no, yes, no, so, please. Just, just a response, and uh, I on that was really helpful saying that we have to look at aggregated measures to really help. And <clears throat> I must say that. We have a lot of digital tools, meanwhile, that is more than than uh, people might expect in the outside world. And we have a very good track record option here. Uh, we have whatever tools that help farmers. Um, and you might say, OK, you are targeting here the, the agriculture in the more developed areas of the world. But I also have examples for bringing this kind of digitalization into smallholder communities in Africa. So we have to make progress here. We have to use the data that we generate. We have to come to a consensus how that is best done so that everybody is profiting from it. And uh, I think that there's a lot of potential and you point to the right direction. We have to make use of all this innovation to, to transform agriculture. And it's a, it's a good, uh, good advice. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Thank you for reflecting on uh, an earlier comment. Just, Just a quick really quickly, comment. we have one more. Go consensus on. about actions at an ecosystem level, because a consensus approach won't be appropriate for many environmental factors because of the vast differences. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really encouraging a much finer focus, a disaggregation of data to ensure that we are optimizing at ecosystem levels. I understand we'll aggregate measures to look at national performance, but what is key is really coming down to that that unit of the ecosystem being used to feed people and 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 uh, animals on this planet. Thank you very much. Really, really helpful, and and we're taking all of these comments on board. And I'd like to turn to our final uh, speaker of today for closing remarks, Ms. Shivani Kanabrihan. Uh, it's been mentioned before, uh, she, she, her, she's part of the team, she's the global program lead for the responsible agriculture supply chains at the OECD. Um, and the OECD has a very key role to play in this initiative as the secretariat, but also really as, uh, as, 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 as the convener of bringing the, these uh, governments and companies together. And the OECD, as mentioned uh, by the FAO colleague as well, um, Mr. Ivancic, uh, has developed internationally backed guidances for corporates and is working closely with the WBA to foster common understanding of corporate reporting and how to stimulate responsible business conduct, one of which is, of course, this OECD and FEO guidance for responsible agricultural supply chains. Uh, Ms. Kanabrihan, I'm really interested to hear your reflections uh, of today's conversation from this vast variety of, of, of different stakeholders we heard from today, as, and of course, on, on the report findings. Uh, I, I'm, I'm giving the floor to you for, for our closing remarks. Thank you. Thanks very much, Victoria. I hope everyone can, can hear me. Um, and I really hope my internet connection stays stable over the next three minutes. Um, but listen, I just want to say, um, first of all, a big thank you. I'm really heartened to, to see that there has been progress in a very short time. I mean, a year is really hardly anything at all. Um, I think one of the things that I really learned is the, the value of improved transparency. Um, bearing in mind, and I do, I do take into um, to consideration the, uh, the remarks on the, the need to make it to actually drill down and to have more um, refined uh, measures, if you will, that are more ecosystem um, specific. Um, on a basis of, of, of what we do have, though, I, I think it's a, it's a good um, basis for discussions with governments. I think what some of the things that did strike me is where we are not seeing improvements, so areas like nutritional, the nutritional areas, um, living income, living wages. I think these are the we need to, to dig deep and understand like what, what are some of the barriers to having change happen at scale. Um, and this is where I think this the G7 sustainable supply chain initiatives can really play a role. Um, you know, if we think through what are the actions that companies can take uh, individually, what are the actions that can be taken collectively? There's a lot of learnings. I think our, um, the BSF was, was highlighting some of the, 
the aspects of sharing sharing learnings. But then importantly, what are some of the things that governments can do you know, in terms of incentivizing change, in terms of policy coherence, in terms of using other government tools that can be um, that you know can be a real smart mix of, of, of policy regulation and private sector action. I think all of us want to accelerate global progress towards the SDGs. How can we do this collectively within the agri-food supply chain? Um, at the OECD, we also think about this in terms of a triple challenge. Um, and we started talking a little bit about this, this, the challenge of food security and nutrition. And let's not forget, but I'm glad to hear from the, um, the dairy farmers there. Um, there's also the challenge of supporting livelihoods, right? Um, how do we cons consider? And that's where the living wage aspect as well comes in. But doing all of this within the environmental um, boundaries of the plant, planetary boundaries. So how do we do this in a sustainable way? Um, and this is again where I do see the benchmarks and um, tracking uh, really helping. Uh, we saw there was also limited progress on scope three def uh, emissions. Uh, we all know that that's, that's critical. Um, I was surprised to see also lack of deforestation and um, forest conversion. So hopefully we'll be able to, to ramp that up a little bit more. Just a couple of other points in terms of the G7 sustainable supply chain initiatives. To all of you in the room or online, if you'd like to learn more about this, um, please contact uh, contact myself or, or you know, WBA or um, the um, representatives from GIZ to, to find out more about it. Um, we have a number of um, key events coming up. We'll be at the COP. I think probably all of you will also be at COP, so I'm sure we'll see each other there either in person or, or online. Um, our work will be featured at the um, Food Pavilion on the Youth Day. So you'll be pleased to see that we're trying to actually make that link to young people on the 15th of November. And then to cap up this year under the G7 presidency and the Germany's presidency, we'll have a final high level event, a meeting between um, minister level uh, policymakers, um, ideally CEO level on the private side, private sector side in Berlin on the 2nd of December. Um, look, I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at, at that, um, Victoria, and uh, give it back, uh, give the floor back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shivani. And uh, I want to thank the, the speakers here in the room, Mr. Keller, Mr. Paul, but also uh, our speakers online um, <clears throat> for joining us from, uh, from Japan to Brazil and everything in between. Um, I hope that, uh, that this initiative has really been, uh, been inspiring and been thought provoking how, how we can work in this multi-sectoral setting together. Big thank you to the UK government for initiating this, to the German government for taking it on this year uh, and uh, to the OECD for being such a skillful host to us um, and companies for joining up and we, we want more companies and we need to really drive change together so uh, hope this has ignited some spirits to uh, to seek that collaboration and uh, looking forward to to engaging with you thank you